So let's, uh, let's uh, we're going to jump in. We've got two pretty packed sessions to get through the information that we want to cover this morning. Uh, so I want to make sure we jump in right away. But while I have everybody's attention, and for anybody who is listening at home, we have a unique opportunity that is coming up. Uh, you may not know this, but Michelle got tasked out of one out of a group of about 40 Belgians, technically uh, people from Flanders, uh, that are living in America to report on the 2020 election campaign. Out of that group, she is about two that are in favor of President Trump. And because that is so novel and so unique in Europe, let alone in Belgium, uh, they are actually flying over a reporter uh, who is going to come up to visit us in Traverse City the weekend of the 24th to report not just on Michelle's story, but they're captivated by her coming over here to be a part of the church and to be a part of the ministry. And so they are going to be here the Sunday of that weekend, and we'd really like to have a full house. So just FYI, I, I need you to act like you're civilized human beings who know how to be among other people. That may, however, be asking a bit too much, so I will be, I will be perfectly happy if you just show up. <laughs> so bear that in mind. Uh, it'll be a great opportunity uh, to have just a, a tremendous witness, uh, not only um, internationally, but uh, you just never know where it's going to go. And uh, we want to, um, she's already been covered on the news uh, live on a couple of occasions and been interviewed in a national magazine there in, in um, Belgium, and it's having an impact. People she hasn't known for or talked to for years are reaching out, and because of that, there's opportunities to share the faith, and it's, it's really exciting. So please participate. Be, please be with us that week, um, the week of, weekend of the 24th. I don't think that's the actual Sunday. Maybe it is, but um, Sunday's the 25th. So be here the 25th. We'd appreciate that, and let's open with a word of prayer. So, Father, we come before you this morning excited to be able to preach your word, excited to be able to explain parts of your word that we often don't spend much time in. And as we take on the subject of Revelation chapter 5, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would anoint my words, that you would give me a supernatural clarity to um, deal with inconsistencies that come up along the way and help us to understand portions of Scripture that could otherwise remain shrouded in mystery and darkness because they're just not the average Sunday morning fair in pulpits across our nation. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you would give everyone here eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive. In Jesus' name, the people of God said. Well, your homework from the last session um, was actually... Let's jump in here a little bit further down. That was your homework from two sessions ago. Your homework from the last session was to read chapter 5 and familiarize yourself with this strange item referred to as the seven-sealed scroll. What is that item? Then we assigned you the tiny little four-chapter book of Ruth, and I reminded you that the Jewish marriage contract is called the Ketubah, and I asked you this question. I said, where is the largest, most detailed ketubah in your Bible? And of course, we're not going to answer that question until session two this morning, but we are going to answer it. I think the answer will surprise you. Then, of course, I said, read Daniel 9, 7, uh, or Daniel 7, 9 through 10. Familiarize yourself with Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel 10. And the question I'm asking there, of course, is where else have we visited the throne room of heaven in our Bibles? Because that is where we entered. Um, that is really where we entered after leaving Revelation 3 and spending our last session together in Revelation chapter 4. We entered into the throne room. And after all the events that we saw there in Revelation chapter 4, the, the, uh, the cherubim that were in those rooms, the seven lampstands that used to be on earth are now in heaven. That's symbolic of the church, the 24 elders. We still had a little bit of an issue. Who are they? There's a lot of scholarly debate about who those 24 elders are. By the end of our sessions together this morning, we will definitively answer that question. And... 
as we progress our way through, you're going to see that there is definitely a method methodology to write scholarly interpretation. But in this session, prior to jumping into the actual verses, because every time I build your hopes up, I say we're going to get right there, and then there's something we need to do. That's because I am a habitual liar, and you should just be used to it by now. The reality is I want to be able to pull into context for you some key components of Scripture that Revelation chapter 4 is alluding to, and, or Revelation chapter 5, rather, is alluding to that, that you may not be familiar with. And it's just not fair to do those portions of Scripture justice by trying to cram them in with our actual examination of the text. So let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about what is this scroll. As we get into Revelation chapter 5, what we are dealing with is history's largest Escrow, escrow closing. This is the largest real estate transaction that is ever going to take place in the history of the universe. You, that seven sealed scroll that John at the end of, of Revelation 4 as worship broke out and then we pivoted to those few verses where the, the excitement, the worship, it all kind of soured when John saw that the Ancient of Days he had in his hand this seven sealed scroll and there was no one who could open it. No one was found in heaven. No one was found on earth. No one was found under the earth that could open the scroll. And John wept because he knew what this scroll was. And we need to know what this scroll is. It is the title deed to the universe. <clears throat> now books were scrolls prior to the second century AD. Later on, Books with pages became known as a codex, and they were big, and they were cumbersome, and, 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 um, and it, it took a while for the transition from that rolled up uh, parchment or papyrus scroll. But what we are discussing here is a sealed scroll or a book with conditions on the exterior and sealed, so it suggests a title deed, and those sealed suggest someone who has to be authorized to break open those seeds. Uh, uh, th those seals. Um, <clears throat> now, there's a lot of scholarly contention about what, what is the best way to interpret this because seals become a very peculiar item. And, and if you want to be overly Hebraic, and there are, some, there are some scholars out there who try to, instead of reading Revelation in the Greek, which is what it was originally written in, they want to they wanna read all of the New Testament from a Hebrew standpoint and um, most of those texts were originally written in the Greek. There's authors that claim that there were earlier, but we don't have a lot of evidence for that for the Hebrew New Testament. It seems like it came later. Any way you want to look at it, the point is that there's, there's some contentions. Were these wax seals? Is that the way that they did scrolls? How did the ancient cultures really do things? Some people say that they were actually just like like signatories that, that had to authorize the opening of the scroll, that, that you had to meet the conditions of each witness along the way to do that, not actually waxed scrolls. But in the first and second century, Roman law required that a will be sealed with seven seals, and that was illustrated by the, the wills that were left by Emperor Augustus and Emperor Vespasian. Now, we know that Revelation from chapter 4 forward is a very Jewish book. It's not Roman in character. It's not Greek in character. But later on in this chapter, I'm going to substantiate for you that in ancient Jewish Hebraic times, wax seals were used on scrolls and, and that the imagery that we're using here, there's a good reason to have this biblical interpretation. And in so doing, I'm going to give you a tool to go back and read one of the biggest prophetic books in your Bible and watch it come to life. Because one of the problems we always have is we don't, we don't think of these people as real history, right? They're just big fancy names. We had a couple, a Circle Sunday a couple, couple months ago where people, they struggled with the names. These characters didn't feel real. I found some great archaeological tools that I'm going to put in your hand that are going to make the book of Jeremiah come to life for you in a way that it probably never has. <coughs> so anyways, Papyrus was a reed or a bulrush. They grew to about 15 feet high, six feet underwater, and they were thick as a man's wrists. Pith was extracted and cut into thin strips with a sharp knife. Rows were laid out vertically and horizontally. They were moistened with water and glue, and they were pressed together, beaten with a mallet, and smoothed with a pumice stone. Okay? 
And that is how we get the scrolls that, that ultimately exist. Now, there is a scroll that gets discussed in one of the prophetic books, which is Jeremiah. In fact, Bethany, if you want to go back uh, to where the offering table is, you'll see I have a stack of printouts for people. Give at least one to each family. If there's enough, everybody can have one. <clears throat> but don't, don't get into it yet. We'll get there. Turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah 32.3. It says, For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, meaning Jeremiah, saying, Why do you prophesy and, and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape from the land, hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. Then he shall see, lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there, shall be until, and there he shall be until I visit him, says the Lord, though you fight with the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. Why, Zedekiah says, are you condemning why are you a negative prophet? Why are you a negative Nancy? Why are you always down on Israel? And of course, that was the hallmark of Jeremiah's ministry. He was the prophet of it's too late. The time for repentance is past. So in verses 6 through 7, it says, And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle will come to you saying, buy my field, which is an Anathoth, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. Now, I want you to pay attention to that phrase, the right of redemption. There are some biblical principles that I want to introduce to you here. <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know, Anathoth was Jeremiah's hometown, okay? And the son of his uncle is it's prophesied to him by the Lord that the son of his uncle is going to come to him and suggest that he buy his land. And what you need to recognize is this was a bad business deal because while Nebuchadnezzar had not yet completely taken over Jerusalem, the cities that were on the outskirts were already captured and under the control of the Chaldean or the Babylonian Empire. So in other words, God is prophesying, your uncle, the son of your uncle is going to come to you and he's going to say, hey, how about you buy my land, which you can't use because it's under Chaldean control. I got a bridge in New York I want to sell you. That's basically what's happening here. But what God is going to do is people often think that because Jeremiah was the prophet who had to prophesy that it's too late, you can't repent, you're going into the captivity, that Jeremiah is not a book of hope. It is a book of hope, and chapter 32 proves it. <clears throat> so verse 8 says, Then Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me. So the last verses, God prophesied it was going to happen. This verse is when it actually happens. In the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord. Now on top of this business deal being bad, he's being asked to buy this property while he is locked up in prison. So not only is it held by your enemies, but while you're in prison and you can't even use it, even if your enemies didn't occupy it, buy this land. Great deal. According to the word of the Lord, and said to me, please buy my field that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is yours. There's that term again, the right of inheritance. And the redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this word was of the Lord, because God had told him this was going to happen says, so I bought the field from Hanamel, the son of my uncle who was in Anathoth, and weighed out to him the money, 17 shekels of silver, or in modern day parlance, about three grand. Okay? And this is what's important. It says, I signed the deed and sealed it. Took witnesses and weighed the money on the scales. So I took the purchase deed, both that which was sealed according to the law and the custom and that which was open. What does that mean? <clears throat> so the title deed to purchase the land in Israel, God's dealings with Israel are all tied up in the land. In ancient Israel, you could not buy property in a fee simple transaction. All you could do was lease a number of years of its harvest. And then after a certain amount of years, 
because God wanted to protect the inheritance of all 12 tribes, that land was released back to who inherited it back during the conquest under Joshua. So you couldn't just purchase land outright. So there's a very special relationship that God indulges with the land and with Israel. After the conquest, the tribes all have the land divided up. They drew lots. God assigned portions of the land to each of the tribes. And under the Torah, especially in Leviticus 25, God gives the basic legal perspective of land ownership and real estate transactions in ancient Israel. Let's, uh, let's take a look at a few of those verses. <clears throat> Leviticus 25, 23 through 24 and following says, the land shall not be sold permanently for the land is mine. See, that was the whole reason why they were able to go into the captivity because when they didn't obey their conditional covenantal contract, God said, the land will vomit you out. You are in this land because I have allowed you to be here. I own it. You're leasing it from me. So when people... In modern day parlance, they have an issue. Well, how is Israel not an occupying force? They're not an occupying force because God is the one who has laid claim to that parcel of property in the Middle East. And when all of the other nations that were doing incredibly horrible, idolatrous things were pushed out by Joshua, they were pushed out because God said, you don't get to be in this land. This is my land. This is my parcel of planet Earth. Go fill, multiply take over all of the rest, but this I'm holding for myself and whoever lives here is going to be a witness unto me and my statutes and they will be my people and I will be their God. That's how God set it up. And he takes that very seriously. He says, for you are strangers and sojourners with me and in all the land of your possession, you shall grant redemption of the land. And that's that principle that... Um, um, Jeremiah's cousin was talking about. It says, if one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. Why? Because the inheritance belongs to that tribe. <clears throat> or if the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, then let him count the years since its sale and restore the remainder to the man who, to whom he sold it, that he may return to his possession. So, as Jeremiah was saying, in ancient times, there are two copies of a deed. One is sealed and preserved in an earthen jar, and one is left open, bearing the requirements needed to break the seals and actually redeem or claim ownership of the sealed deed. The sealed deed is what gave you ownership okay so that is what is taking place in that space and I just want to be you know really clear that this is a biblical <clears throat> so when the one the other was open and it gave those requirements and this was all looking toward a day that Jeremiah knows he is not going able to take going to be able to take possession of this land He's in prison now, and he knows the Babylonians are going to take over the land, and he knows because he's the one that prophesied that Israel would be in captivity for 70 years. It is Jeremiah's book that Daniel is reading in Daniel chapter 9 that gives Daniel the clue, oh, the 70 years are coming to a close. I need to pray for the restoration of Israel. So in his adulthood, Jeremiah is buying this property. He's commanded to buy it by God. During a time when he knows he's never going to actually be able to redeem it and take possession of it. But he's doing it because it is actually a sign. When that deed was sealed away in an earthen jar. That God is going to bring the people back to the land. Jeremiah is a book of hope. Even though their sin was going to have them ousted for the land for 70 years, God, before it ever happened, said, look, take this deed. It is going to be held in reserve for the one, your descendant, your heir, who will have the right to redeem this land. And that became a picture of the entire land 
of Israel. Do you see the picture? What is happening in Revelation chapter 5 is taking it to the macroscopic level. It is now looking for the heir who can redeem the title deed to the universe to finally come back and claim what is rightfully his. And that is why, because of understanding the scriptures, John weeps when no one can be found in heaven, no one can be found on earth, and no one can be found under the earth to open the scroll. You understand what I'm talking about? Okay. Very important to understand these principles. Now, as I was saying a bit earlier, people like to say that, that those seals, they weren't really wax seals, that the, that the Hebrews didn't use wax seals. Well, interestingly enough, I have on your screen a copy of eight different seals, all of whom come from just before or during the life of Jeremiah. <clears throat> Nine seals of historical figures that were literally relevant to Jeremiah's life. The first seal, the one on the ultimate left, <coughs> is the seal of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the famous high priest from 1 Chronicles 5.39, who served during the late 7th century reign of the righteous king Josiah. These types of clay seals, in archaeological term, they're also called bulla, B-U-L-L-A-E. Or, and what is amazing about this first one is it contains two generational matches for both the high-ranking officials because it literally says the son of Hilkiah. So two characters are named on this one seal in the Hebrew. And it was found in the corresponding biblical location to where these two individuals would have lived. The second seal says belonging to Hanan, son of Hilkiah the priest. And this one is still in the signet ring that it was crafted into. Again, demonstrating that a scroll could have definitely been sealed by wax. The third one is the seal of Nathan Melech. And he's mentioned only once in the entire Bible in the context of one of King Josiah's purges of idolatry. It says, Then Josiah removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance to the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the officer who was in charge of the court, and he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. 2 Kings 23, 11. When people say that the Bible is a fairy tale, never believe them. Because we have evidence that even someone who has nothing more than half of a Stan Lee cameo in the Bible actually existed. I think that's pretty incredible. The next one is a very significant seal. And this is the fourth one on your sign. Because how many of you know Jeremiah had an assistant that was his scribe? Can anybody tell me his name? His name was Baruch. This was Jeremiah's right-hand man, okay? He's mentioned in the Bible as Jeremiah's right-hand man, okay? And that reddish-hued seal is the seal of Baruch the scribe. <clears throat> it refers to Jeremiah's very own scribe, Baruch the son of Neriah, and this is the very person who, in a few verses, we're going to see this, this, the title deed that Jeremiah bought that land with. It's Baruch that he hands it off to to take care of it. We have his seal. <clears throat> in fact, there is even a chapter of the book of Jeremiah aimed directly at Baruch addressing a particularly difficult time in his life. And that's Jeremiah 45. The fifth seal is the seal of Gemariah. Jeremiah 36 reveals that the prophet had been put under some kind of house arrest. His assistant Baruch had to deliver the prophecies to the temple grounds. Baruch did this in the chamber 
of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe. Verse 10 of that chapter. Another biblical character confirmed. Seal 6 is the son of Hananiah. Belongs to Hananiah, the son of Azariah. And Jeremiah 28 details one of Jeremiah's opponents. The false prophet Hananiah, the son of Azur. And Azur is simply the shortened version of the name Azariah. Hananiah and Jeremiah have a very famous public showdown. Jeremiah is prophesying doom to Israel and, and judgment. And Hananiah is prophesying that it will not happen. And he takes this yoke that Jeremiah had on his neck and breaks it. And Jeremiah says, you may be able to break my yoke, but the yoke that God has, has put on you is a yoke of iron. It is unbreakable. And he tells that false prophet that he will die. And of course, Jeremiah is pro in a battle of let the prophets whose words come true be the real prophecy. Hananiah dies. We have Jeremiah's opponent. We have his seal. He was a real person who actually lived. Okay. The seventh seal is the son of Jehuqal. Um, and it's unusual because it identifies three generations. Jehuqal's grandfather and his father. Um, his grandfather not mentioned in the Bible. The eighth seal is another one of Jeremiah's opponents. A man by the name of Gedaliah. And it's found in the same general location of the Jehuqal seal. And together, these two princes are mentioned in Jeremiah 38, describing how they resisted Jeremiah in his efforts to decry the king, and they were upset with the, with the, with the um, loss of morale that it happened on the people. They didn't like Jeremiah's negativity, and they stood up to him, and again, Jeremiah overcome. There's even one more seal that is not pictured. Belonging to Icar, son of Madaniah, and it's interesting because it probably predicts and, and holds down a very dark event. The name Zedekiah, the king we read about early on, was given to that king, not by his birth parents, but by Nebuchadnezzar himself when he appointed him. His original name was Madaniah, according to 2 Kings 24, 17. So thus, this seal... Again, found in a proper location befitting its dating and his father's name may have well belonged to one of the king's son, a son who is subsequently executed by Nebuchadnezzar himself. All of this is outlined in the handout that I've given you. We're going to post a link to the article online so people watching online can find it. <clears throat> but what I wanted to do for you as part of this morning's session was to pull some of what we're going to be talking about in Revelation out of the mythical, out of the allegorical, out of the symbolical, and really ground what's being done here in reality. Because all too often we read the funny names, we don't know who they are, we don't understand what's happening, and we begin to lose that connection that when you're reading the Bible, a lot of the time you are reading actual historical accounts. And no matter how many times scholars over the years have tried to say, nah, they didn't exist, archaeology always comes down the path. And here's the thing. I've showed you nine of these seals that they found. Some of these were found, some of these boule were found in caches of over 600 different boule. Collected at some time in history to be found. Even the most minor characters in the Bible get confirmed by actual secular historians. The Bible is the most reliable book from all of antiquity when it comes to recounting history. Nothing comes close. Okay? So moving forward, Jeremiah 32, 12 says, And I gave the purchase deed to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Mahasiah, in the presence of Hanamel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses who signed the purchase deed before all the Jews who sat in the court of the prison. And again, those witnesses, they sealed the deed. Either with their signature or with an actual wax seal, the evidence can speak to both. So the word is sealed. It is hatam. It is the verb form of the Hebrew hotam, the term for a stamp. 
This important document was sealed by the stamp of Jeremiah and probably other witnesses. It may have even included the seal stamp of Baruch that we saw earlier. The purchase was then passed on to the scribe who had been promised divine protection in Jeremiah 45.5 for this document safekeeping. By purchasing this land, even as Jerusalem was being destroyed, Jeremiah was showing the Jews that they would one day return to Jerusalem. He was aware of God's plans for Jerusalem and was investing in Jerusalem's future. An investment in the word of God is never a bad investment, no matter what your present circumstances are. This gesture provided hope and optimism. Their time in Jerusalem was ending, but God's prophet was investing in the city. He knew God would once again perform a great and wonderful work in Jerusalem. He knew the Jews would return. And today we have to carry that same hope. It is as relevant today as it was in the time of Jeremiah. Bible prophecy tells us that the city of Jerusalem is about to experience some terrible destruction in future days. That's what we're going to read about as we get to Revelation 6 through 19. But we have to remember, we have to be invested in God's plan. He says, then I charged Baruch before them, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, both this purchase deed, which is sealed, and this deed, which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they may last many days. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. And for time's sake, I'm going to skip ahead. The book goes on to describe why they're being kicked out of Israel. But when we get to verses 42 through 44, it says, For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great calamity on this people, which he was describing in the previous verses, he says, So I will bring on them all the good that I have promised them, and fields will be bought in this land of which you say it is desolate without man or beast. It has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Men will buy fields for money again, sign deeds and seal them and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin, in the places around Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the lowland and in the cities of the south. For I will cause the captives to return, says the Lord. Do you understand in, a, in, a, in, a, in the life of a guy like the guy that wrote the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah, weeping, in, in a set of five funeral dirges for the death of his country and the death of his city, he had to, in the midst of that, buy on faith with money he probably didn't have as he was sitting in prison. Believe in the future redemption of his land. As dark as things get in our world, we have to believe that there is one waiting to take the deed, redeem the land, and restore everything. That was once stolen. That's the picture. I want to remind you of the parable of the field and the treasure that Jesus talks about in Matthew 13. It's a very interesting parable because the principle that's being shown to us is there is something valuable in that field, but you cannot own the treasure without first taking possession of the field. Go with me. To Matthew 13, 44, it says again, remember now, Matthew 13, 38, Jesus tells us the field is the world. There should be no other parabolic interpretation of this text. He says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field or a treasure hidden in the world, which a man found and hid and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Why? Because just because he knew the treasure was in the field, if he had taken the treasure without first owning the field, it would have been theft. But if he owns the field, he owns the treasure, and he has right to whatever is inside of it. You understand? Who's the man who buys the field? Jesus. Who's the treasure that's in the field? We are. That's the picture. He purchased everything and that gave him title 
but it did not yet give him possession. He has not taken possession yet. He is not seated on his throne. He is seated at the right hand of his father. God's people are numbered. They're not infinite. The Lord Jesus is waiting for the father to tell the son that the number is complete. And among the things that happen that Revelation describes, there will be this seven sealed book that is the title deed. And it has to be taken by a kinsman, somebody who is related to the person who originally owned it. And he has to be pure and righteous and he has to be able to perform what is required of him. What we are talking about here is the biblical principle of the goel. That's the Hebrew word. And that is two aspects of Jesus that are described for us by two very different characters in the biblical text. And I want to refresh your memory of them. <coughs> you can think of this as two sides of the same coin. And that's why I put a Hebrew coin up on the screen. One aspect of the goel is the aspect of the kinsman redeemer or the rightful heir qualified to redeem the land and take possession there of it. The other is the avenger of blood who is authorized to pronounce judgment on those who brought death to his family. The Goel was responsible for both. Let's take a look at one and then the other. The reason that I assigned you the homework to read the book of, At, uh, the book of Ruth is because Boaz in the book of Ruth is the picture of the kinsman redeemer. He is the Goel in the story. Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, had an inheritance that she lost because her husband died and there was nobody there who had said, I will redeem that land for Naomi. Ruth was Naomi's daughter-in-law and her husband had died as well. That's why they couldn't redeem it. They needed a near kinsman to come and to buy the land. And because of another law that exists in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, it's called the law of the Leverite marriage. <coughs> when your kinsman died, specifically if your brother died and he did not have an heir to carry on his inheritance, the brothers were required to marry his brother's wife and sire a child, and that first child that he sired with his brother's wife was not considered his child. He was considered his brother's child for the purpose of inheritance. Therefore, the land could continue to be owned by the rightful heir of the land. It was a law that God put in place. All of those laws in those first five books of the Bible that nobody likes to read, they all have a purpose. And the only way that God could, or that Boaz could redeem the land was to marry Ruth. Moreover than that, Ruth was the treasure that he wanted, and the only way that he could have her was to redeem the land. The same picture as the parable we just saw in Matthew 13. Let's look at a few verses from the last chapter of Ruth where the redemption process is taking place. It says, now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down and there and behold the close relative. The whole problem in the story of the book of, the Ruth, uh, uh, the book of Ruth is that there is one kinsman who is a closer relationship to Naomi and to, um, to, to Ruth than Boaz is. But Boaz is in love with Ruth. He wants her to be his bride. Imagine, if you will, Ruth as Chris, or, uh, Boaz as Chris Hemsworth. And this nearer, closer relative, he's Josh Gad or he's Danny DeVito. Okay? And, and you think that it's all going to work out well for them and all of a sudden you go, oh, but there's that guy. <laughs> so what Boaz does is he goes to the nearer kinsman of whom Boaz had spoken and he came by. He says, hey, fella, come aside, friend. Sit down with me here. So he came aside and he sat down. And Boaz took 10 men of the elders as witnesses of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. 
Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. That's Naomi's husband. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. And Boaz is like, oh. But then Boaz says, well, on the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth because Ruth inherited it because she was the wife of uh, Naomi's husband, or she was the, the, the daughter-in-law of Naomi's husband, the wife of the dead to perpetuate or raise up the name of a dead through his inheritance. There's two laws that came into place. <clears throat> and the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I ruin my own inheritance. I can't marry her. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I can't do it. And everybody goes, Whew. says, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in Israel. Sandals were used as old worn out sandals were used as boundary markers on property. And the Bible even talks about this in other verses in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy that when you, when you swear an oath like this, you take your shoe off, you give it to them, and what he's basically doing is passing on the right to own those boundaries. That's what's taking place. So then in Ruth 4, 8 through 9, it says, Therefore the close relative said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal, and Boaz said to the elders and all the people who were witnessing this, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was uh, Kilion's, uh, that was Ruth's husband, and Mahalon's, her, bro her brother-in-law, from the hand of Naomi. I've taken their inheritance. It says, moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Mahalon, uh, Mahalon I have acquired as my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brother and from his positions at the gate. So she was married to that guy, not the other guy. You are witnesses this day. So this was prescribed in Deuteronomy 25. In order to bring Ruth to Naomi, Naomi had to be exiled from her land. Naomi is a picture of Israel. Ruth is a picture of the Gentile church because Ruth was from Moab. She's not a Gentile. She was not an Israelitess. In fact, she was actually forbidden by Levitical law for marrying into. The whole picture of Ruth is the story that what the law could not do, grace did. Ruth does not replace Naomi. Naomi still needed to be there for the redemption of the land. In fact, Ruth learns that Boaz even exists because Naomi taught her. Just like we in the church learn that Jesus even exists because we read the Old Testament and the Jewish texts to find out who the Messiah was. Naomi, though, the picture of Israel, she actually meets Boaz because of what Ruth, the church, does for her. And that is what's prophesied, that when, when the church is taken out, there will come a day where Israel will recognize they missed their Messiah and they will repent and they will look upon him who they pierced. And when they cry out in unison that we repent for denying you as our Messiah, that is the triggering event that sends Jesus back to earth. No matter how much Boaz loved Ruth, he had to wait for her move. She was the one that appealed to him. Boaz and not Ruth, confronts the nearer kinsman. Boaz, not Ruth. Jesus is the one who goes to the one that's standing in the way of redemption and says, you may think you own this, but I'm the redeemer. And he tells the one who thinks he owns the kingdoms of this world, step aside. That's the picture. Now, the other one that we want to deal with here, we've dealt with the nearer kinsman, but now we need to deal with the avenger of blood. And we won't go into as much detail on this one because we will see it more in coming chapters in Revelation. 
But we see that Jesus is qualified to be our kinsman redeemer. Revelation 4 through 19, <coughs> excuse me, is his taking possession of that which he purchased. He purchased it in his first coming, but he hasn't taken possession of it yet. That's the story that we are unpacking as we move through Revelation 4 through 19. And if any commentator's picture of Revelation does not emphasize that that is the narrative you are watching, set their commentary down and walk away. One of the reasons we know that it's not spiritual, that it's not, or excuse me, it is spiritual, that it's not symbolic, that it's not allegorical, that it's not happening now and being fulfilled, that it needs to have a future fulfillment is all of these laws are not prophetically fulfilled. Look at the types and the models. They are literally fulfilled. Jesus has never literally taken possession of what he purchased 2,000 years ago. Not yet. But the time is coming when he will. And because of that, because he hasn't taken possession of it yet, there are those who are interlopers existing on his territory. There could be a Ruth chapter 5, but there isn't. The reason there isn't a Ruth chapter 5, but there could be, is because Boaz could have gone out to that field and found out that he had a bunch of people with squatters' rights who had taken up residence and were harvesting on that field since Naomi and Elimelech sold the land. And he may have had to dispossess them of where they had taken up residence. But there is a picture in the Bible of a character who acts in that role of the avenger of blood, who steps in and has to dispossess seven tribes from land that God has declared does not belong to them. And that's Joshua. And that is why I often encourage you to read the book of Joshua where he dispossesses the usurpers in the land and conquers it with God's chosen people. Seven tribes that remained, three were put down and there were seven left. And the three tribes were the subject under the conquest of Joshua, but actually under Jesus Christ. If you read Joshua 5, very carefully. It becomes a model of the book of Revelation. So as we continue to go through this series together, you should have the book of Joshua open. You should familiarize yourself with it because you want to be able to draw comparisons. Joshua in Hebrew is Yehoshua. Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. The names are very similar because Joshua is a type of Christ in the role of of the avenger of blood. When Christ came the first time, he came as the kinsman redeemer. When he comes the second time, he comes as the avenger of blood. When he came the first time, he came as the lamb of God. When he comes the second time, he comes as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Do you understand the picture that's being painted for you? This is why I took the time to set the stage. And after the break, we will get in to Revelation chapter 5. Let's take a break. There are 